Welcome back to The Ancient World, a podcast with discussions and presentations of Greek myth and philosophy, symbolic readings of the biblical stories, and the renewal and rebirth of the ancient treasures in the Florentine Renaissance. And today we're going to talk about two main topics, two books. This is firstly the On the Heavenly Hierarchy by Dionysius, and the other one is More of the Life of Moses from St. Gregory of Nyssa. So these are two very important books uh, and they're both from, so Dionysius is uh, dated to be in the in the mid-late 400s. St. Gregory is the late 300s. And they are both combining both the Greek and the old biblical stories. So the, the philosophy and the theology uh, and also lots of the symbolism and the spiritual deep. And it's also something to note here. We're going to go through a few examples in both of the books, but... Dionysius is giving us uh, a kind of a clear structure, which is very much the one that Dante is is using as the model for his paradise. And then St. Gregory is in some sense more of a kind of a process-oriented way of describing how there's a progress and how there's a, a growth and almost like an organic movement through a spiritual kind of birth of the spiritual life and then how it how it keeps changing, and then you get into different stages. So, but we'll we'll show this more clearly with some examples now. And um, we're gonna read several small fragments from the "On the Heavenly Hierarchy" or "On the Celestial Hierarchy" by Dionysius. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful little book. It's just sixty six pages. Some editions are even fewer pages, like just like more uh, f- full pages, but. In this version, it's 66. And uh, just for a quick overview, so this is where you get the definition of the nine levels of, of angelical beings, which is the nine levels in Dante's Paradise. Uh, and he's also, so he's describing these levels and he's also combining it also to some extent with the with Plotinus way of looking at like uh, the divine as the source of all being and this light that is uh, like illuminates and is reflected like to varying degrees in the different levels and also then finally down towards the, the human life and the earthly life and uh, yeah you're going to show how he's, he's kind of ordering this um, there are several other topics that are really uh, interesting and essential for understanding his uh, his view so first of all the opening is this unity theme so it starts with uh, every procession of illuminating light proceeding from the father whilst gi- whilst who visiting us as a gift of goodness restores us again gradually as a unifying power and turns us to the oneness of our conducting father and to a deifying simplicity for all things are from him and to him as said the sacred word so just a, a little reminder of how the paradise opens with Dante. He says, the opening tercet is this, the glory of the one who moves all things, penetrates all the universe, reflecting in one part more and in another less. That's the overall structure of the whole paradise before we start on the journey towards <laughs> the source of, of the light and the being. It's also fascinating, if you have the paradise kind of in the back of your mind, how... Dante is taking the structure from Dionysius and then both using that as the final part in the Empyrean, but it's also creating this, this amazing and beautiful journey that so the angelical beings are reflected down into the spheres, which are then their own stories and their own f- full of, of, of just the wisdom and the, and the gradual understanding and, and more and more the growth and ability to absorb and understand more of the divine wisdom and the divine light. So, if we follow the Dionysius, so he has this opening about the oneness. And there's another thing with Dionysius, he's talking about, he's reminding us, this is a little bit almost this idolatry theme in the old biblical stories, uh, that whatever we are imagining and how you how you construct this 
in your imagination and how you experience it, both emotionally and spiritually, it is not what it's not the real thing fully. It's it's a it's a representation of it, but the real divine <laughs> realm is way beyond this. So he's um, he's saying here that. Uh, you have the mystical traditions of the revealing oracles sometimes extol the august blessedness of the super essential uh, divine as word and mind and essence manifesting. It's the divine becoming expression and wisdom, both as really being origin and true cause of the origin of things being. And they describe it as light and call it life. And then it comes, while such sacred descriptions are more reverent, and seem in a certain way to be superior to the material images, they yet, thus, in reality, fall short of the supremely divine similitude, for it is above every essence and life. No light indeed expresses its character, and every description and mind incomparably falls short of its similitude. Which is also a part of the paradise like Dante is, is um, reminding us, or Beatrice is reminding us that, she is explaining and showing the pilgrim these things in a way that is uh, understandable or graspable or possible to experience for the human mind of the pilgrim. So it's, this point is being taken up. And it's an important one, also because your ability to imagine these things and experience it will also change, which is also a a way of being reminded that it's uh, it's uh, it's again according to our capacity to to imagine or trying to understand. So that's the important reminder. And then the next point is um, he talks about hierarchy, which again is the structure. And this is uh, this is more of to understand the way he looks at hierarchy and uses it as a way of ordering these uh, these topics, this knowledge. And for Dionysius, the hierarchy is something that is reflecting uh, part of the divine in itself. So he's saying that hierarchy, the chapter three is called, what is hierarchy and what the use of hierarchy? Hierarchy is, in my judgment, he says, a sacred order and science and operation assimilated as far as attainable to the likeness of the divine and conducted to the illuminations granted to it from the divine according to capacity with a view to the divine imitation. So that's just a a, a setup or a, or a preparation or a framing of what he's about now to tell us with uh, angelical orders and and the, the heavenly spheres. So then he also talks about the divine ray. So he's saying that uh, the purpose uh, of the hierarchy is to as- as assimilation and union as far as attainable with the divine. And he also talks about the supremely divine ray and devoutly filled with the entrusted radiance, and again spreading this radiance ungrudgingly to those after it, in accordance with the supremely divine regulations. Just another reminder of th- this divine ray is described in the Empyrean as the moment when the, the one little ray comes from the source of the light and, and, and being in itself. So this one little ray it's coming down, and then when it hits the p- primo mobile, kind of the outer shell of all, all the spheres, which is the one that, the f- primo mobile, like the first mover, so this one little ray is hitting the primo mobile and sets it into motion, and that's the beginning of time. And then that motion is r- kind of transferred down into the spheres and also to the to the earth. So the, the ray kind of just hits and the, and the primo mobile starts to move. Time starts. And then the ray is reflected up 
into kind of this huge circular lake first because it hits a, a sphere so the light is then spread into this huge lake and that uh, surface of light transforms into the divine rose which is also so the <laughs> or like an amphitheater where the the lowest part of it is bigger than the sun so it's enormous rose or amphitheater with all the blessed souls just the, Another example of how this this one little concept of a divine ray was picked up <laughs> in the paradise by Dante. So uh, he, we also see again and again the topic of according to ability. So when Dionysius is talking about the hierarchical order, he says uh, hierarchical. Thus, each rank of the hierarchical order is led in its own degree to the divine cooperation by performing through grace and God-given power those things which are naturally and supernaturally in the divine and accomplished by it super essentially and manifested hierarchically for the attainable imitation of the God-loving minds. And then Dionysius continues with another uh, part of this text, which is super interesting and is very profound. This points to the opening of the biblical stories as well. So he talks about uh, this peculiar characteristics of the cause of all things and of goodness surpassing all to call things being to participation in itself. So he talks about here the, the different levels of angelical beings are the kind of they created from the source of like in the divine source, but they're also participating in it. So is this one in many concept? Uh, for all things being shared in a providence which bubbles forth from the superessential deity, cause of all things. For they would not be unless they had participated in the essence and origin of things being. All things then, without life, participate in it by their being. For the being of all things is the deity. Above being, things living participate in its life-giving power, above all life, things rational and intellectual participate in itself perfect and preeminently perfect wisdom, above all reason and mind. It is evident then that all those beings are around it, which have participated in it in many forms. A very profound part of the thinking of Dionysius and a link to the opening of the, of the biblical stories with Elohim creating the heavens and the earth. So Elohim is can be described both as all the spiritual beings and the source of all the spiritual beings. Elohim El also is like Aleph, the first letter, which means also one. And then Im is the ancient Hebrew plural ending. So they are like one with a plural ending, meaning then many in the one. And then also that the description of Elohim is the same thing. So you have the the source and all its manifestations at the same time. And they are then, in some sense then, as Dionysius calls it, participating in the source. So it's uh, it's a place where you can connect these, these, these concepts or ways of thinking. And then we have a few more uh, topics here. Dionysius talks about the illumination and the power it aggregates. So he talks about throughout every sacred ordinance the superior ranks possess the illuminations and powers of their subordinates but the lowest have not the same powers as those who are above them. This is the, the different like the nine levels of the angelical beings. So the higher ones have all the powers of the lower ones but not the other way. So there is a Kind of level and then the more of the of the the power or the energy and the love and the, and the and the abilities from the beginning are reflected and then in some ways less and less for each level and then all the way down to finally the earthly life and the <laughs> us as humans so after this Dionysius starts going through the nine levels which is just going to run through them quickly, the seraphims, the cherubims, 
the holy thrones, the authorities or dominions, the lordships or the strongholds, the powers, and then the principalities, the archangels, and then the angels. We're going to focus on the top three. So this is also seen as three times three. The top three, the highest order, are then the seraphims, the cherubims, and the thrones. So this is another very essential part of, of the, the thinking here. So we, whilst admitting this as an arrangement of the holy hierarchies, affirm that every appellation of the celestial minds denotes the godlike characteristic of each. And those who knew or know Hebrew affirm that the holy designation of the seraphim denotes either that they are kindling or burning and that of cherubim, a fullness of knowledge or stream of wisdom. Naturally then, the first order of the heavenly hierarchies is administered by the most exalted beings, holding as it does a rank which is higher than all from the fact that it is established immediately around the divine. And then they are called then burning and thrones and streams of wisdom by a name which sets forth their godlike condition. It's just, it's worthwhile to stop at that and just reflect on it. So if you think of angelical beings as spiritual forces or forces of nature or just uh, kind of abstract things that can explain the world around you, uh, for example, then, if you if you look at history or or like how life and time is, is is growing and and evolving, you can look at things like knowledge as a force that is shaping how the world is 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 progressing or, or kind of uh, organically growing. The same you can think of love, both in your personal life or in society or in history, as a force. That is, <laughs> that has a, an enormous impact. Like both the romantic kind of uh, or motivating force within yourself, and also in the more Greek version of, of describing love as that which moves things into their natural place. Which is also why they could say that the planets are moved by love because they naturally belong in a circular movement, which is eternity and perfection. So it's. it's it also has a mechanical definition in addition to the more emotional and romantic way of, of experiencing it. So what Dionysus is doing here is he's saying that the, the forces closest to the divine is the knowledge and the love and then the thrones which are uh, that <laughs> upon which the divine is sitting. So sitting doesn't mean physically sitting, but that upon which the divine is resting is, is kind of the, the complete tranquility also. So those are the, as, a, as is presented here, the three kind of really deep fundamental forces of existence and being and also kind of beyond exist or in terms of like the spiritual uh, realm and, and existence as well. So that's important to have, like in the in the, as as a back backdrop for for reading both Dionysus and the Paradise. And then we have more connections to the biblical stories. So he talk he talks about um, he has examples from from Isaiah. And he also so. One of the things he's saying is like the first hierarchy, which is then the, the top three of the heavenly minds is purified and enlightened and perfected by being ministered by the very author of initiation through its elevation to it immediately being filled according to its degree with the all together most holy purification of the unapproachable light of the perfect source of initiation unstained indeed by any remissness, remissness and full of primal light and perfected by its participation in first given knowledge and science. But to sum up, I may say this, not inappropriately, 
that the reception of the supremely divine science is both purification and enlightenment and perfecting. So this is just he's repeating some of the, the, the main the main point that he is making. And then we have uh, two more main points, which is Isaiah. So right after this, he, he moves on to, to referencing the holy, holy, holy. Lord of Sabbath, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then we get a little reminder of, of uh, the angelical beings and then how this is above the, the earthly life. Uh, the revealing order of the principalities, archangels and angels, the three lowest levels, presides through each other over the hierarchies amongst men in order that it uh, that the elevation and conversion and communion and union with the divine may be in due order. And then we're going to get to the purification of Isaiah, which is done by the seraphims. So, Dionysius has some thoughts about this. Uh, we're just briefly going to also just read that passage from Isaiah, which is in chapter 6, where it says, In the year of the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke." And then verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So this is what uh, Dionysius is referring to as the purification and he says then that he reasonably attributed this to the seraphims after the divine, the characteristics of purification by fire. Uh, the theologian attributes his own purifying science and power to the divine indeed as cause, but to the seraphim as first operating hierarch. As anyone might say, with angelic reverence, was teaching one who was being purified by him. Uh, so this is a point for reflection, but then like the purification or like a spiritual cleansing for Isaiah is coming from the top level of the of the angelical beings, which is the love. And there you can interpret this in many ways, but you can think of like the the power and the effect and the potential in love to transform your own life. It can it can uh, kind of change your whole thinking, your whole <laughs> outlook, your whole understanding, and also kind of the way you look at energies or how things are working, the dynamics of existence in itself, if you take it a bit <laughs> far. Um, as that, the, that is the one of, so it will be the strongest force that can really transform a person. Uh, which in many ways makes sense also if you think of life in general and, and, and how things are in, <laughs> in our human lives. Okay, so and then just one last point is that he talks about the wheel as a symbol. Uh, there's also a nice little touch here towards the end of it when Dionysius suddenly says, Come then, let us at last, if you please, rest our mental vision from the strain of lofty contemplation. This is a bit the same we had in um, also in Philo, that you get this personal address. Uh, you also have it in Gregory of Nyssa. Like, they just show that they are uh, conscious of and, and considerate of like the, the heaviness sometimes of the topics or like the, the challenge in, in trying to understand and apprehend kind of the deeper the deeper knowledge, so it's a it's a nice kind of touch as the connecting touch in in the, this short book, and then he talks about the wheel, which is also from the end. This is the last point of the whole paradise, uh, and the wheel is also then a circle. 
But he says here that uh, he starts with uh, we, that we must examine the facts that rivers are spoken of and wheels and chariots attached to the heavenly beings. The rivers of fire signify the supremely divine streams furnishing to them and then grudging an incessant flow and nourishing the productive powers of life, the chariots, the conjoined communion of those of the same rank, the wheels being winged and advancing without turning and without deviation, the power of their advancing energy within a straight and direct path towards the same unflinching and straight swoop of their every intellectual track. And that it's also possible to explain, after another mystical meaning, the sacred description of the intellectual wheels. For the gel gel is given to them as the theologian says. This shows according to the Hebrew tongue, very important point there, revolution and revelation. For the Empyrean and godlike wheels have revolutions indeed by their perpetual movement around the good in itself, but revelations by the manifestation of things hidden and by the elevation of things at our feet. And this is again the ending of the paradise when Dante says, when he has the, the final big flash of understanding and then you have the, the last tercet, which is, at this point power failed high fantasy, but like a wheel in perfect balance turning, I felt my will and my desire impelled by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So you have the, the wheel in the perfect balance turning. And then the sense that Dante is finally then dissolving just into being the universe or the, the full union with, with the being and the everything. So that's, that's another kind of point where you can connect uh, Dante with Dionysius. Okay, so... Uh, this episode is going to be a lot longer than planned, <laughs> but it's there's so much so much uh, stuff in it. <laughs> so, so uh, but this was overall um, a brief introduction and overview of Dionysius. It's highly recommended to read it. It's again sixty six pages. So then we're going to move on to the second topic of this episode, which is uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa and the life of Moses. In the second part, we're going to look at one part of the journey in the life of Moses from after the crossing of the Red Sea, and then including a part of the of the ascent of the mountain, for, of the mountain of the divine knowledge, uh, as interpreted spiritually by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, but first we're going to have just look at uh, the cover art of the book, so this is from the edition of the Classics of Western Spirituality. And then it's a really nice uh, painting on the front page. So I'm going to have a link in the description so you can look at it. But there are some thoughts from the from the, the artist. So the, the name of the artist is William Rabinovich. And he says about the cover painting, The watercolor is meant to convey a stained glass effect in order to bring out the luminosity, fluidity, and intensity suggested by St. Gregory's life. I have worked in an expressionistic style reminiscent of the highly expressive Greek icon and mosaic art, but reinterpreted in a 20th century way so as to create a kind of aesthetic bridge with his time. The figure of Gregory conveys the degree and asceticism of necessary mystery he espoused as a correct way toward the path of enlightenment. And then also, uh, the triangle form beyond the halo conveys his strong sense of the trinity and the unity of man. And then, final very important point, another aspect of the triangle suggests its allusion to Mount Sinai and the idea that achieving of each summit creates new horizons, emphasizing Gregory's idea that progress itself is perfection. This is really a great, uh, it's a great statement and a great thought from, from the artist. And it also captures some of the, the, the really deep points of Gregory that uh, life is progressing and, and growing perpetually, the same with the divine, so it's both eternal and eternally progressing at the same time. And it's this kind of organic movement uh, which goes through uh, your own life or your spiritual journey, your spiritual life 
and also the understanding and that it it never ends and that's the perfection of it in the way Gregory is thinking so it it is it's a slightly different way of of thinking and experiencing and imagining things than the structured way of Dionysius which we just been through so um, and both are really great way of of learning and trying to understand more uh, but there's something very uh, but it depends <laughs> people are a bit different but there's something very inspiring and encouraging with this thought that uh, there's always new adventures to go on and new things to learn and that's um, that's what Gregory is trying to show us so uh, we're going to look at that part when so after the crossing of the Red Sea which he describes as one of the major uh, kind of steps in a in a spiritual journey where you leave all or at least you try to do like you leave passions and negative instincts or or the evils behind you which is then symbolically represented with the egyptian soldiers that are being drowned in the sea and then afterwards you have the first stations in the desert so then you have new steps on this on this journey and then so the first one is that they come to a little water, but they can't drink it because it's uh, it's uh, sour. But then it's made uh, drinkable by throwing a piece of wood. So the first they, f- they found the water so bitter that they could not at first even drink it. But wood placed in the water made the drink agreeable to those who were thirsty. And then Nissa says that this is then when you throw the the, the wood in the water. He connects this then to the to the New Testament and the and, and like being the cross that you that, that comes into the water, and you can also see it as a symbol of kind of the, the spiritual that changes something profound in life. That first it might seem undrinkable, but with more spiritual understanding, it changes. This goes back to the the thought we also had in the previous episode about learning a language of philosophy or learning a language of the spiritual or the religious or also the language of myth. Um, that there, there's a little bit of a, uh, spending the time to, to understand the thinking in the way of learning a new language. And then things change sometimes like, <laughs> not uh, not to the opposite, but it, it something that seemed, for example, uh, more like dry or, or, or not very exciting becomes really sparkling because you understand what you have to build the reception center in your brain or in <laughs> in your spiritual part <laughs> first, and that takes a bit of time. And when you build that up, you also build up an ability, and then you can really see things as they were meant to be presented in the first place so it's not there's a there's a lot deeper meaning in throwing a piece of wood into the water as just defying laws of nature and then suddenly the click it's it's drinkable there is a much deeper meaning to it for some of this is very obvious for some people it's the first time you ever hear it so it's a <laughs> it's a just a little reminder of this uh, and then saint gregory is one of the best ones to to read to as an opener into this. So after this incident, the next thing is that they come to um, a sort of an oasis, and then uh, which is then of twelve springs and seventy date palms. So then, or as I said, like the next resting place on the journey, replete with palm trees and springs, refreshed the travelers. There were 12 springs of pure and very sweet water and 70 large high-crested date palms, which had grown tall with the years. What do we discover in these things as we follow the history? St. Gregory asks her. Uh, That the mystery of the wood through which the water of virtue became pleasant to those athirst leads us to the 12 springs and 70 date palms, that is, to the teaching of the gospel. So this is Gregory. He's connecting things to the New Testament now as the 12 apostles and then the 70 apostles that is that are later being sent out uh, and after this one 
the next point on on this uh, the station so like the things that is happening on on the journey through the wilderness or the desert or in your spiritual life is then the manna so they uh, they run out of the food that they prepared when they were in Egypt and in some sense that food is not fully uh is still in some sense a little bit influenced by that which was before so the next thing then is that you get the manna or the food from the heavens. So you could see this also as then you get the spiritual nutrition from a new place in your journey. So you get new nutrition, which is not tainted in some sense by the starting point. So that's an important step. Then there's uh, there's lots more to say about that. We're going to keep it a little bit short now. Uh, trying 40 minutes-ish <laughs> for the whole episode. And then the war with Amalek. Uh, so there's also a, a war there. And then he sudden, uh, finally comes to the mountain. So what he says is, there, is that in order to, to start to climb the ascent of, the, of the, the real mountain, there is a long process before this. And it also... In those stations after the crossing of the sea, you have to discover new things spiritually and you also have to then get the new nutrition spiritually and you also have to get rid of a war, get rid of some more of the old stuff. And then you are kind of, in a sense, purified enough or prepared enough. This almost goes back to the beginning little scene of the Moses baby in in the little ark the little basket with woods of spiritual education that can 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 protect you and help you go through the this uh, the the chaos of life or the streams of the water and then guide you gently into the side so a tiny point to that in terms of now you are ready through for and through your experiences to start the final ascent there and um <laughs> There's so many things happening at once uh, at this point, both in this, the old stories and the way that Nyssa is is um, interpreting and explaining things. Uh, but among other things, so he he stresses that not everybody would ever come to that point that they can really try to or start this this climb of the mountain um, because it's challenging and it takes a long time as well. Uh, but once you start doing it, and when Moses starts to climb, there are two main points I'm just going to point out quickly towards the end, which is that he then sees the divine in the darkness. So this is an overall theme in Gregory of Nyssa, that you, the divine is first, it first comes, like the theophany comes through the light in the bush. So you, you see the divine, you get your first glimpse of, of, of some, something <laughs> spiritual and inspiring and enlightening in you, which is seen as light then it appears as this uh, the cloud this kind of little mino tornado that is following them which is more of a it's a guide through several steps and it's also it's meant to portray how it could at times be like a foggy or <laughs> unclear journey through the cloud with the cloud as a guide but then once he starts uh, the climb of the mountain he also sees the divine in the darkness, which is the third stage of this, which in some sense means that you start to understand things also in the hidden and in the unknown. So you start seeing through a journey and through learning, you start seeing and understanding things that are, that are also in the dark and, and in the hidden. And this is also when Moses is then, then getting the tabernacle presented to him. And this is uh, one of the most profounding elements <laughs> of the whole of the Old Testament. Um, so again, there's so much into this, and we should spend another episode, I think. But from the from the Exodus chapter 24, at the end there it says, "And the and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud." So think of this as there's a spiritual journey and, and you're getting closer to big understandings. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and, and got him up into the mount 
and Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then what he's being told here, also after uh, you had this that he sees, sees the divine in the darkness, is that the message is uh, that speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take on them. And then he goes through materials, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and rams and oil and spices and stones. And then let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show, show you thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So this is where you get the mini temple of the tabernacle. And the very profound point here is that until this point, you see, they see in the story, the divinity is connected with the mountain in this case. But now you're getting the transition that the divine is moved from nature into a little temple and a movable temple and a temple that is within the tribes of Israel when they are moving in the desert. So we'll get back to what that means symbolically a bit later, but but this is also historically seen as very profound that the moment when, when people moved the, the concept of the divine uh, from nature into a, like, uh, like a temple or a book or the stories, your your spiritual concept of the divine is changing. It becomes closer to you also in a sense. And then even more deeper here is that it points in some ways back to the opening line of the whole of the Old Testament with in the beginning it was created the heaven and the earth. So the spiritual was created and then the material. And then chapter one, you have the creation story as in the way that Philo sees it is um you create the spiritual, the blueprints, the concepts, the potentiality of things. And then in the second chapter, this comes into material being through shaping the soil and blowing life into, into the nostrils of, of Adam. So this heaven and earth is repeated over and over. And what is happening here is that Moses gets the vision of, or the, the message or the revelation or, or discovers or is being told <laughs> the the spiritual um, structure of the tabernacle as a temple or as the dwelling place for the divine. And then it's described in detail and then he's told, go down and build a material version of that which I have shown you. So to create the, the, the copy in the material so you have a place to access the spiritual. And, and there you have this whole duality of of the stories with the spiritual and the material and it's also important a side note but the hebrew language in itself the sounds of it are constructed to unite the spiritual and the material that's that's what they're aiming for in the sounds of the language in itself so this is <laughs> this is the kind of the deep and foundational part of it and it's reflected in so many of the stories so uh, Yes, we're going to stop it here. Uh, we have to continue this <laughs> in another e episode. Uh, but just to sum up this, the, the part with the Gregory of Nyssa is that there is still a journey. You have several steps in the journey. And, and this step, and like this is a part of uh, being patient and appreciating education. And then that things will change and transform and then you will come to to like higher steps and you will also then if you think of um, like brain science even like you you do grow cells in your brain and you build a physical reception apparatus in your head to interpret and, and experience and understanding these stories and the symbolism of it and then more and more you might f experience that what you see also like in art or if you go uh, even if you go into a church building and then you suddenly might see more of that inner spiritual world that you are building and expanding and the things around you as connecting reflections of that. 
and then then you're kind of reaching a, a different way of, of experiencing this. So this is again one of those uh, major topics and and what Saint Gregory is trying to to show us and explain to us. Uh, okay, so 45 minutes. We're going to stop it here and. Um, Hope some of this was interesting. Uh, and again, as we said before, both of these books are really easy to read. They read almost like contemporary. <laughs> it could be written today or 100 years ago, even if they're 16, 1700 years ago. Uh, and they're also interesting because they, they come at a time when they are still grappling with how to unite the Greek myth philosophy with the Hebrew stories and and what to make of it and how to, to, to different ways of of uh, learning and understanding and kind of creating a synthesis or a blend of it and then lots of sparkling <laughs> wonderful things happen when they do that. So uh, that's uh, all for this one. So just want to say um, that yeah, I hope some of this was interesting. Uh, hope that you have some food for thought. And as always, thank you so much for listening and see you again soon here on the Ancient World Podcast.